I think what, we, what we've heard is the, the goal uh, for Adelaide to become a carbon neutral city. Now that's what's known in management terms as a big, fat, hairy, audacious goal. Setting those sorts of goals takes courage, it takes vision, and it takes leadership. And so we thank, thank you, Premier, for the leadership that you and your government are bringing uh, in, this, in this very, very important area. And of course, we also see uh, many examples of that, including the one that Terry Burgess mentioned earlier, of the recent train extension, or of the train extension, which has been funded by state government uh, and federal government, uh, which will extend the train line here to the university uh, in the coming, in the next year or so, uh, and I think make a very meaningful impact on the transport, as a trans part of a transport solution uh, here in Southern Adelaide. So let me now please uh, invite our panel uh, to uh, please join me uh, at the front. We have, of course, the Honourable Jay Wetherill, Premier of South Australia. We have the Right Honourable Martin Hazy, Lord Mayor uh, of the City of Adelaide, uh, and we also have, of course, um, Roland um, Bush. So please uh, uh, join me in welcoming our three panelists. <laughs> Let me just start by asking Roland. Now, we've seen, of course, the, uh, the plan we heard uh, in your marvellous presentation about the, the many different uh, mega trends and the, some of the worrying ones around the new Munich every, every week, I think you said. Yes. Um, but in your presentation, you mentioned the number of the different types of approaches that a city uh, might take uh, in addressing its carbon uh, balance. And I just wondered, uh, from the, the work that we see here from Siemens, uh, if there are any particular technologies that you think would be particularly applicable uh, in Adelaide. So um, this is now really a 30,000 feet uh, answer, which I give you. Um, and then you normally have to look what is specific about Adelaide, about uh, the state. And we, we had a discussion before that. And what is specific, of course, is the availability of natural resources. I mean, you won't believe it because in Germany, the sun is not shining so often, but we have a tremendous amount of photovoltaic. So this is something where you very often wonder, is that going the right direction? But here you do have, you are blessed with uh, natural resources in the right place. Um, so this is w one point, I guess, which, which I would really uh, look into in order to leverage that better. Um, this brings me to a second point, because if you do that on the one side, you on the other side, you know you're then dealing with intermittent energy. So that means you have to think about what combination. I mean, it could be gas peaker, but it could be also, and gas, we know that this is uh, scarce and, and you don't have enough gas, but it could also go in the direction of, of thinking about storage, which is the next wave. Storage, by the way, can trigger a, a disruptive change in the whole energy system. Anyhow, and you were talking about, would that be an opportunity for you to really lead also innovation or new markets, new technologies um, in, into scale? So that would mean storing hydrogen, would be an idea, and that would then nicely fit into the idea of running cars on a more, um, on a, um, let's say, less carbon uh, fuel, which would be hydrogen or electric. So this is one thing. Uh, the other element, I guess, is um, that is, is your mobility. Uh, you do have already an existing proper public transport. Uh, so based on that and leverage it and, and f finding ways how to really make smart investments in the future, um, that's something which I believe is also a very, a very interesting point where you should look into. You, you made an example when you're connecting Tonsley now. Um, connecting an area with a public transport rail bound um, is a commitment. And this commitment um, will definitely develop your area even faster. So that means you can shape your city if you make the right choice of putting public transport into certain areas. This is the second element where I believe it's a good starting point good ideas behind, and if you follow that path, I think you have a, a, not only a carbon neutral city, but also a growing city. Thank you. And perhaps if I could then turn to the Premier. We often, the, the social and environmental aspects of the debate often dominate the discussion. Uh, most, I think, right-minded people you know, agree and recognize with the, and, and resonate with those arguments, but what do you see as the, the main economic opportunities for South Australia? Well, we, um, we're going through a period of um, transformation of the South Australian economy. So old manufacturing is generally described as in relative decline, uh, but 
we still want to be a manufacturing state. Uh, what that means, though, it'll be a different type of manufacturing, which will be the sort of manufacturing of the future. Um, an element of that, a critical element of that, will be the technologies associated with uh, responding to a carbon-constrained environment. Um, so the, the technologies associated with, uh, for instance, uh, wind energy, the technologies associated with solar energy, and some of the emergent technologies, whether they be solar thermal or geothermal, wave energy, um, the, uh, also the, uh, the, the technological challenges associated with managing grids. Um, all of these represent opportunities for, uh, for jobs and growth in the, the South Australian economy. And ultimately, if we're able to we're obviously in a, in a transition phase in relation to the electricity market. We've got a national electricity market which is punishing us for having a, a high amount of renewable energy, even despite the fact that there are national imperatives to do that. So the, the two elements of national policy don't talk to one another. Ultimately, this will be resolved in favour of uh, a, a rational climate change policy. And so those states that have actually made the adjustment to a, a lower carbon constrained, uh, lower carbon intensive economy are going to be better placed to take advantage of that environment. And it could well be that we could have some of the lowest electricity prices, some of the lowest energy prices uh, in the world rather than some of the highest because we've, we've been able to make this transition first. And the true price, if you like, of these things have been properly incorporated into our products. So I think that there are, I think there are other sort of benefits as well. There are companies actually increasingly are being forced by their shareholders to not only deliver a bottom line but also an ethical offering. Um, it may be in the past we've been competing purely on the basis of cost competitiveness and and other things. Increasingly, companies are more uh, are also thinking about things like livability. And so the way your city operates is, can be an important source of attraction for people and investors. But also they want to know that you have a low carbon footprint. And at the moment we can say on the mainland, if you come to South Australia, your company will have the lowest carbon footprint anywhere in this nation. And this can be a source of competitive advantage as we attract capital and investment into our state. So it has lots of benefits um, which are not just directly about the jobs associated with the technologies. Thank you. And of course, those of us who uh, live here know all about the livability uh, of the city of Adelaide. And if I could perhaps ask the Mayor, we see that there are many cranes in the CBD at the moment. There's a lot of development, a lot of work going on, evidence of the, the growth and uh, regeneration. Uh, I just wonder um, what you see as the, uh, the, the major first next steps uh, in this program from the city's perspective and also how you see the private sector might contribute uh, to, the, to the overall goal. Thank you very much. And um, Colin, just further to what the Premier was saying, I think we are really in this unique and actually very exciting point. This is where our size as a city actually becomes our competitive strength as a city. We're big enough to have critical mass but we're small enough, I think, to be quite agile. And this is really a time to be agile. So, um, Dr Bush, thank you very much for this work. Um, this is certainly informing our pathway towards achieving it. So it's um, an extraordinary, so thank you. But um, interestingly, we look at um, Adelaide as being what, the fifth most livable city in the world, which is a great accolade, uh, no doubt. Um, but we've got a goal to become the third by 2020, and we're asking us the ourselves the hard questions in terms of how do we go up that leaderboard and even further and what does that mean and how do we quantify it? Well, if we now put this sustainability layer over everything we do as a city, um, because I don't think business as usual is going to be the thing that's going to take us further up that leaderboard in terms of livability. I think this sustainability lens in terms of everything we do is critical to it. Um, thus, the importance of uh, Carbon Neutral Adelaide 2025 and a lot of the measures we have and the partnership that we have with the state government. Um, it, is, it is a true collaboration um, between uh, capital city government and state government of South Australia, um, but it's also a true collaboration, also what I call laterally, 
between city council and a myriad of other metropolitan and regional councils. I think we're truly working on this endeavour together and uh, it's got a lot of transformational power on that in itself. But the collaboration, of course, goes to industry. Industry experts like Siemens, of course, um, but sectors like our property community most particularly. The Premier spoke about the Building Upgrade Finance Initiative. And City Council's got a fairly strong role to play here in terms of um, what's our role in terms of enabling greater take-up once that, um, the regulations have been written for that legislation that comes into operation. So we need to lead by example with our own building stock. Um, Adelaide City Council is a reasonably uh, substantial building hold holder. Uh, we need to lead by example with all of the sustainability measures wherever we can on our own buildings. We need to lead by example with our own fleet. Um, we're adopting rideshare, co-sharing measures in terms of our own fleet and we're looking at how our own fleet is powered. Um, we need to achieve carbon neutrality ourselves as a city council on our own operations and we'll do that by 2020. We are some 60 plus percent of the way there already. So we need to be 100% as a city council carbon neutral on our own business operations. We're well on the track towards achieving that. The, um, and I think we've got an education role to play too. And the function which was held by the Property Council at the Convention Centre earlier this week where the Premier and I both spoke was very much about opening that dialogue in terms of education with industry. But we've got to frame it in a, as the Premier said, a uh, sustainable economic and competitive advantage type of lens um, this is what brings industry to the table quite rightly, is that I call it, a, I call it the what's in it for me factor. Um, and people quite rightly ask that question. Um, the environmental benefits, I think, are just a, uh, a given. They are an absolute necessity. So getting a lot stronger, which this report helps us do, um, around quantification of those economic benefits in terms of 50% reduction in carbon emissions means X number of jobs over a 10-year period. Those types of statistics are absolutely critical because they resonate with business. And if we look at sustainability as a means of competitive advantage for business in South Australia, and that becomes our source of competitive advantage nationally, it really changes the debate. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, there must be some questions uh, from the audience now. Do we have a a microphone, it's just coming to you now. Uh, thank you, Don Manifold from uh, EY. Thank you uh, to uh, Dr Bush and also the Premier on uh, some uh, great observations and uh, com commend you on the, uh, the wonderful goal. Just as a, a more purely finance question for Dr Bush, you put up return on investments on two examples, both above 15%, and my first reaction is, or the private sector for an infrastructure asset would rush in to invest in that. Um, what, what do you see as a sort of um, barriers, if there are any, of greater private funding or private sector funding to the type of initiatives that you put there? You know, this, this is a simple question and a multi-dimensional answer. Mm -hmm. um, let me start in, a, in our small Siemens world. Um, so very often, I mean, you, you talk, to, talk to a plant manager of one of our plants somewhere in the world, uh, whether or not to invest into energy efficiency, a project with return of invest of, let's say, four, three, four, five years. Clearly, he sees the business case. And then, I mean, this is the world, how it is. He has a budget for this fiscal year. And for this budget, he has to invest, of course, also into the next manufacturing line or upgrade of his digital uh, agenda for manufacturing. And then he says, well, this is my budget and I don't have more money, so then I'd rather go for my core business, which would be, whatever, the new line, the digital agenda, rather than energy efficiency. So there's the, at the same time, he acknowledged very well, that, of course, there's a business case, but these are the limitations. So. Um, other one is that you really have, uh, uh, very often you have cases where you have limited resources of structuring this project properly. Um, it's just, just a matter of, uh, of, of um, let's say, and, and it requires more than one, one dimension. No? It requires a company who's doing that, it requires uh, the customer, sometimes it's a government, um, so therefore you have not enough resources. And, and then sometimes it's just missing getting the right parties together. There's a reason why we, uh, in, the, in, the, in the city week in Singapore, 
we published um, a piece which is talking about financing solutions for cities, energy efficiency solutions. Um, we will bring all the best practice examples together, how to tap onto this money. And there should be money in there because uh, with low interest rates, uh, a big chunk of money is looking for even longer term of return with a decent return. Decent return, which is not that high, infrastructure projects should be on the spot. So therefore, I believe um, it's not really the availability of money, it's really finding the ways how to really remove the barriers which you see uh, in different areas. And, and again, I can go longer and longer, uh, but, but this is basically it. One last element which is really hindering is, in many countries we see electricity is subsidized, in particular in emerging countries. They subsidize in order to stimulate growth, in order to, um, let's say, give uh, electricity for people. Um, with an electricity price of three, four cents a kilowatt hour, energy efficiency, the business model for energy efficiency is really difficult to show. So therefore, this brings me back to my discussion on CO2 pricing. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, Richard Turner from Zen Energy. And my question for Dr. Borsch as well, um, with some discussion around it, would be can South Australia become the new Saudi Arabia of the low carbon world? Um, we, we were visited here by uh, Christiana Figueres, uh, head of the UN last year, and uh, she said to us, and she, we were the only commercial company she visited in Australia, she said, you have a real responsibility here in South Australia, you have the best wind and solar resources in the world, and you need to develop these microgrid con economies, you need to develop you know, hydrogen generation, and, and uh, once we complete our diversity, as the Premier said, of, of energy generation with large-scale solar, we have the wind, we need to expand that, technologies like pumped hydro and then balancing all of that with large-scale batteries, we'll have the lowest power generation in the world here, we'll have abundant excess energy that we can run hydrolyzers and produce vast amounts of hydrogen and other associated fuels that we can then export to countries like Korea. And we were, visit we were visited by a delegation of Koreans just recently <clears throat> looking very enviously at South Australia and, and we're looking at them saying, you've got the best battery technology in the world that we use and integrate here. Um, but they're looking at us saying, You're the, you've got the best energy generation potential for renewables, we have limited ability to produce it, and many other countries like Japan have limited ability to produce renewable energy, and they want to move away from nuclear. There's just such an, such an export opportunity for South Australia to become the centre of the new low-carbon world. What would be your opinion on that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a brief answer. <laughs> Premier, Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm, point, point I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. Uh, I think there are a lot of things coming together in South Australia. Um, is it natural resources? Is, is your ports? Is the neighbour to Korea, Korea, Japan? They are really. They would pull. They have a good customer for hydrogen slash ammonia. Um, if you go that path, um, um, and again, um, I think uh, the. the the closing remarks. It is about. It's about leadership. It's about taking it on because you have to walk new paths. There's, you would beat the pack. I know that um, we are very af active also in Middle East, Saudi Arabia, you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Of course, they're looking also into the world after oil. And, and if Saudi Arabia is continuing the way how they did in the past, uh, within, I think, five, five, seven years, they would consume all their oil within Saudi Arabia. They don't have a chance to export anymore because they're consuming so much. This is not an option either. Uh, nor for the people. I mean, you also have to look for jobs and, and therefore, I mean, it, it is an opportunity, um, but you really need uh, some bold moves and, and courageous moves in order to, to lead it into that direction, absolutely. But, but let's say the setup, I would say the setup and the, the environment is there. Yeah. So I think there's a bit of a challenge in that, in that question, Premier. I wonder if you'd care to comment. Yeah. Well, we, we've, uh, we just met earlier uh, to talk uh, about the whole question of uh, the hydrogen opportunity and the uh, ammonia, liquid fuels. I mean, the ridiculous thing is we're producing all this energy, but we can't, uh, we can't send it anywhere. It just has to be spilt into the, into the earth. Um, so that could be used uh, to generate um, through a technology to um, uh, create ammonia which is a liquid fuel which might also have the capacity to be used in mobile transport systems. It could also have the effect of stabilising our, our uh, national electricity market by providing a, a, essentially a means by which the intermittent power, which 
uh, suddenly comes on and off can be essentially directed to some productive purpose. So this has lots of benefits and it could be, it could also be a fuel which could drive some other baseload generation. So there are lots of virtues about this and it's a very exciting time at the moment. But it, I mean, one of the things that lots of people are running around urging us to press the button on one technology or another, I think it all comes back to this question of if you had a price on carbon, uh, these, these technologies would compete against one another and one would come out on top but it's not really a role for government to pick which technology uh, should be the winner. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And uh, I'd like to obviously uh, add my thanks uh, to our panel. Uh, however, I'm going to invite uh, Don Russell, Dr. Don Russell, uh, the Chief Executive of the Department of State Development, to come and give the official vote of thanks. Don.